Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. Um, okay, so uh, it's uh, great to be here to, to, to do a, a seminar. I've not delivered in this format before, but it's based on courses that I have been teaching on um, Western Quran and Hadith studies, basically. Right, so we call it Orientalism, but basically it's Western approaches to Quran and Hadith. But these are the sources of, you know, of Islam. They're the most important uh, you know, sources of revelation. Therefore, they've attracted a lot of critique uh, and discussion from the Western scholars, and I want to sort of, uh, can we have the mic down a little bit? It seems very loud. Um, uh, uh, yeah, just, just a touch. Um, yeah, so um, I want to uh, b go through uh, with you some of the approaches of major scholars of the past and up take things up to contemporary day and talk about the field of academic Islamic studies. Um, I want it to be in as interactive as possible. Um, uh, hopefully we're going to have, so I, want, I encourage questions, uh, I don't want to necessarily save these for Q&A sessions, I think that can be a bit artificial, it's a small group, uh, so when you've got a question, raise your hand and I'll try to come to it as soon as I can, and just be aware that we want the, it to go through the mic so the people online uh, also can hear the questions, and likewise questions might come, from, might come from online, and I will try to keep track of those as best I can. Um, uh, what I want to do, um, just run through what the, the sessions. Uh, the objectives of those different sessions and how I want to do it. So um, you can see on here, um, we're, we're, we've already started uh, into uh, Western Hadith Studies 1, uh, early days until the 19th century, Golzi and then Shachts, which is into the early 20th century. Um, so what I, you might think, well, why start with um, Hadith and not with Quran, right? Because uh, Quranic Quran is the first source, right? Or soul wise yes. But when I've, I've taught this several times, and I always started with the Quran on that same basis, and what I discovered is that when I would come on to teach, when I was teaching the Quran, a lot of things I had to mention would have been covered if I'd already done Hadith first. And this is because um, Western scholars themselves, um, they didn't start off really looking at the Quran that much, and instead they would see, is they would see um, Islam, and we'll come on to this, as Muhammadism, right? And because they would see Islam as Mohammedanism, right, then they would start with kind of Sira and a bit of Hadith all mixed together. And so um, this, was, uh, this helps, it helps a lot to study, I think, the, the approaches to the Hadith first, and then to go back and then to look at Quran after having done that. So I'm going to try that out today. Um, hopefully it'll be useful. So we're going to look at the early days. And then um, after Asr, inshallah, we're going to look at some of the more contemporary approaches to uh, Isnad criticism, particularly. Um, and the current state of the field, uh, and with a comparison to uh, sort of traditional approaches that you will uh, learn, for example, in Islam Institute. Um, and uh, then after the a break there, hopefully, um, we're going to go on to, again, take it back to the, start the Quranic studies again from the earlier days, and take that through as well, and go to contemporary Quran studies. So it's kind of four thematic blocks, kind of er early Hadith, later Hadith, early Quran, late, later Quran, that's the plan. Um, uh, I, don't, I can't pr promise to know all, the, know all the answers to everything, to get everything right, to be free of mistakes or errors. Um, so, so just be cautious, be aware. Anything I may say, um, it, could be, it could be wrong, right? Um, I, I'm not ma'asum by any, any means. So do check things um, yourself. Do ask me questions if you think, oh, I'd, I've heard differently, or maybe you've got that wrong. Uh, but hopefully together we can uh, benefit. I always get as much out of teaching these sessions as hopefully anyone gets from them. Um, so, so now I want to go on to the historical background and hopefully go pretty quick, but I'll put some um, of the key stuff down and I'll kind of run through it so you've got kind of notes as it were to kind of help you. Um, you don't have to, don't feel you have to copy all this, but like just um, if I mention a date or something, um, uh, it will help you maybe to um, just have it there and you can catch it up if you do want to take no notes. So basically what you'll see for um, about a thousand years, so from when Islam really emerges uh, into the attention of Europeans, and, and, and we're mainly going to focus on this course on the European response. Um, in fact, I think almost without exception, every single major figure I want to look at is a European, uh, even if some of them did teach in America. I don't think there are any actual uh, Americans that I want to particularly mention. Um, uh, and it's really just this European phenomenon of uh, commentary on on Islam, um, uh, of course, uh, North America is, uh, you know, in its, in its academic culture is largely coming out of a European context anyway. So um, there's this kind of 
um, sort of stagnant theme that goes for about a thousand years. And this is the idea of um, the prophet, uh, sorry, Salam. They understand the prophet as, as the so called great imposter. Okay? So, what this um, is about is this, uh, the idea that, w well, the, pr the prophet Muhammad is, is claiming to have received a revelation, but wait a minute, this is after Jesus. There's no function of a, a you know, Jesus has come, uh, Christians. In the Christian context, um, Jesus has come and, and uh, they believe Jesus has come and died for their sins, right? If Jesus has come and died for, for your sins and you're okay, you just have to believe in Jesus, why would, you need, why would there need to be another message, right? This is their agenda. So he has to be an imposter. And if you read um, uh, Edward Said's um, uh, Orientalism, which is like a key sort of text, um, it, you know, it's a bit dated now, but it's a key kind of text to understand um, the kind of critique of Orientalism that's emerged in, in recent decades. Um, he actually um, mentions in there that for, 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 for a long time, whenever the sort of Western scholars or Western um, elites or even people, authors and opinion formers, clergy and so on as well from the church, whenever they would mention the name of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would just automatically say the great imposter after his name. So as Muslims say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we ask for um, blessings and peace to be sent upon him, they would have this thing of the great imposter, because they don't want to mention him and give any credibility to, to his uh, uh, message or claims. Uh, so this kind of polemical image, and it, it's a mainly a Christian polemical image, um, of course, a, Ju a, a Jewish uh, scholar um, would also have similar issues, right? Uh, they, they, they say after Moses, you know, that we don't need anyone. Um, uh, to bring law, at least slightly different claims from the from the Jews, but similar idea. They, they didn't um, they didn't uh, uh, ex uh, accept the messengership of um, of Isa Islam from the Muslim perspective. Um, so uh, this this polemical image means that really there's a it, it, it kind of infects everything that gets done. Uh, there's something interesting things are done by um, the, the scholar, by scholars of the, um, the West, but. Um, it's, it's pretty slow work and it's not very objective. So, for example, um, um, uh, you've got um, oh, and another. You've got so, for example, the first one of the first things is in the eight, late eighth century. There's a Christian apocalyptic biography of the Prophet Sallam produced in a monastery, right? And often in the, in the this is kind of the so-called dark ages of the of the Christian um, um, West. You've got really intellectual activity happening amongst the monks in monasteries, people in you know churches. Um, you know, you don't yet have universities. You don't have a hugely literate culture, right? Meanwhile, obviously in the in Muslim lands, it really develops into the the so-called golden age of um, you know great uh, 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 translation movements in Baghdad, the great hadith col collection uh, movements, the scholarly developments that we talk about sort of the, the of classical Islamic period. Um, and what you'll see is there's a great power. I mean, Muslims' armies, um, they, they, they nearly get to the edge of Europe, like the, the ones from going through um, Spain. After Spain, they get to the edge of France before they stop. And likewise, um, in, in, in the East, Muslims are spread all the way to, to, the, sort of to India, really. Um, and so you've got a huge um, uh, power coming to the Muslim empire at this time. And the Western powers, they're, they're disunited individual kind of countries, and even like Italy isn't even a country, it's just these different states, city-states, uh, and, 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 and sort of smaller countries, not unified. Um, this so-called Christendom, Christendom, or you know, Christian lands, um, they feel very much under pressure, they feel very weak. Um, and this, um, any, any culture that feels greatly under pressure and feels weak can sometimes, uh, you know, result to this kind of um, propaganda methods, right? So, I mean, to give us a modern example, it's a bit like trying to get an object, trying to do objective scholarship of the, of the rest of the world from, like, North Korea or something. That's, like, kind of the sort of example you give these days. Somewhere where you're, it's a small state, it feels under pressure, and, you know, you, what you're going to get inside that state is probably not going to be that objective about the realities of the outside world. So this is what, sort of, I mean, that's a bit of an over-example, but you get the idea for, for Europe. And this only starts to shift uh, after the Industrial Revolution and the rise of European power. And interestingly, you're going to start to see more objective views of Islam uh, being developed out of that context. Um, so some other key information here. Peter the Venerable, the abbot of Cluny in France, commissioned translations of Islamic texts. 
These would be translations probably into Latin. Um, uh, so Latin was the scholarly, obviously the scholarly, la scholarly language of the, of the West. Of the West. Um, and you, you don't really get that much happening. I mean, there's a few things here and there. You're going to find some like early uh, Arabicists, you know, um, developing. You get a chair of uh, uh, Arabic in Oxford and, you know, places like Bologna, uh, you know, major u universities start to develop um, in the sort of Middle Ages. And they will have some interest in translating um, uh, from, uh, from Arabic. Of course, um, you get a, a big influence into the philosophy, so it's not so uh, much interest in Quran and Hadith, for example, but you get a big interest of the works of people like Al-Ghazali, uh, uh, Averroes, or Ibn Rushd, um, uh, Ibn Sina, uh, as they call it, Avicenna. So they have um, an interest in these figures. Why? Because they're transmitting much, as insofar as they transmit Greek philosophy and the kind of the, the sort of um, uh, that kind of tradition of, of of thinking, then they can accept that. But just they're not very really interested in the Quran or in the Hadith in the way that Muslims are. Um, then you start to get these kind of more individual authors writing biographies into the, about the 17th century, and here is where you start to get this shift. Um, so, for example, Humphrey Prideaux, uh, 1697. Um, it's still this old polemical style, Ma Mahomet, this is the way they would write Muhammad uh, often, Mahomet, the true nature of imposture. So there's sti still this, so this, so this is like from, we said from like the 8th from the eighth century up until the end of the 17th century, so that's 900 years and there's not been much shift in the, in the polemic, right? Um, uh, it, starts to it starts to change a little bit into the 18th century. You've got Henry Comte de Boulogne-Viers, uh, writing uh, Vidi Muhammad, Life of Muhammad, uh, in 1730. But really, it's only when you get into the 19th century that you start to get a more scholarly, attempt to do a more scholarly approach to um, um, Sira and Hadith. Um, so, for example, you've got um, uh, 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 one of the key texts that gets identified by Western scholars up until today that they will mention this is a a Abraham Geiger. Was hat Muhammad and Aus den Judentum aufgenommen? Yeah? What, did, um, what did Muhammad take from Judaism, basically? Right? So again, it seems like it's polemical, right? but he is actually trying to... It's not just wild claims, but in, in, in the sense of earlier people would just make up information. So earlier, some of the earlier Christian scholars, they would just make up things. So they would... Um, uh, you know, uh, invent, they would say that the, 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 the prophet trained a dove to come and sit on like his shoulder and that, and, and, he, and, and you know, that's how he um, said that revelation was coming to him. This is what they would, and this is because the, the dove in um, Christian iconography is like, represents often the Holy Spirit. So the connection there to Holy Spirit, the Ruh Qudus, Jibreel. So they have this connection where, okay, revelation the, the Muslims say that revelation is coming from Jibreel, therefore what really was happening, and they just make this up, that, you know, obviously that a dove, the Prophet would train a dove to, to, to come to his ear and then he would say, I've got a revelation from, you know. Um, so this is just, just, just really absurd things that they would, they would claim in these earlier books. From the 19th century, someone like Abraham Geiger is more, he's looking at, okay, well, here are the aspects of ritual law that, that Muslims practice, these seem similar in some ways to practices of the Jews, you know, for example, in, you know, uh, you know slaughter of animal, you know, of meat, or whatever, right? Praying, you know, the, the prayers, timed prayers, and so on. Uh, and he would probably bring, th he'd bring things out, for example, of the, um, the prophet's um, experiences, you know, that he would go to Medina, then he prayed the same way as the Jews, and so on and so forth. So it's this kind of attempt to look and try to, and, and this, again, this becomes a new pattern into the 20th century is this idea to sort of look at um, things that Islam has in similarities with Christian scholarship or Jewish history and scholarship and to sort of claim a borrowing from these sources, right? So this is something you'll be probably familiar with. It comes up in kind of modern day polemics, you know, various keyboard warriors on the internet uh, claiming that, you know, everything in the Quran is taken from the Bible or something, right? And they, people go back and forth and debate and stuff. So this is what you get. Um, and then you have um, uh, really some of the uh, bigger scholars in, in, in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, you have uh, Gustav Weil, right? 
um, Muhammad the Prophet sign Laban and sign Lira, right? So the, the, you know, the Prophet's life and his teachings. So here you have Seer and Hadith being covered together in, in, in a book. Um, you can see um, uh, German scholarship bec becomes important in this period. Uh, and, the, and German scholarship has been very, very strong in Western Islamic studies up until today. Um, uh, that's 1843. And he also produced the first uh, tra translation of Ibn Hisham's biography in 1864, right? So, um, so, so Vial is very important in the generation, like before Goldzia, uh, who we'll come on to. Um, it's the, in the prehistory, is this like Gustav Vial? Obviously, he's compiling sources. And what's happening now is they are actually trying to translate books of Sira, trying to translate collections of Hadith. So they're trying to get an accurate picture of the uh, life and teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from original sources and they're trying to sort of use the methods of kind of modern philological scholarship. And partly this is coming out of um, their own approach to biblical texts. Because in the 19th century you have the rise of biblical criticism. And what, um, particularly this is spearheaded by Jewish scholars, but also um, Christian scholars were involved as well. And they would be looking in and, and centered in places like Germany, which uh, had a uh, you know had large had a large pop Jewish population um, in in that time, um, and ex established sort of rabbinic culture. Um, what you would see is um, uh, an increasingly critical mindset towards the biblical texts. So they would start to analyze the Bible, and rather than just to say, well, this is just in, in literally all inspired scripture, they would start to look at, okay, um, what different layers of tradition have come together to form a, a given uh, chapter of the Bible. So they would say, okay, there's this one layer of tradition that seems from one period, and they give it a name, and they say, this is the so-and-so commentator, and they say, this other part of tradition. So they start to sort of try to disentangle biblical texts into different component layers and strata, different sections, in order to discover kind of, you know, what, how, are these, how do these Bible texts come together, right? And this becomes very significant when we come to their approach to Islam, because what they will be trying to do is to be trying to sort of look at um, Hadith and Quran um, in terms of, um, you know, individual layers of text or layers of um, uh, uh, tradition that have been brought together. Um, so, so you'll see this um, uh, uh, emphasis coming through. Um, you have um, from, uh, I think, Scottish um, figure uh, uh, Muir, uh, Life of Mahomet, in 1856 to 61. And this, you know, if you go to a library, you can find this. It's a thick book in which he tries to, you know, give a kind of full commentary uh, of the life of the Prophet um, and bring in Hadith. And, you know, and, and here he... You know, if you read it, it's, you know, it, to, our to our modern sensibilities or to our Muslim sensibilities, certainly, and I think even to w uh, Western ones today, it's, it's, it's very, it's still got this polemical edge, right? So he's still, he will be, he'll be coming, coming with this kind of uh, Victorian idea of mor Victorian morality, and he'll be saying, oh, look how the Prophet has this many wives, or, you know, so this kind of agenda, a different agenda maybe than in previous generations, but in many ways, it would be the same kind of uh, approach. Um, to, to look for criticism, but rather than just make up the criticism, he's trying to go through books of Sira using Arabic sources. So it's, try, it's, a, it's at a, a more scholarly level, right? Um, and then you have Alo Sprenger, Das Leben und die Lehre de Muhammad. So you see the same, same kind of, in the same period, people were writing these basically the same titled books. And it was always this um, combination of Sira and Hadith, life and teachings, put it together, and they would even put Qur'an in there, right? Because we th would think, okay, Sira and Hadith. But when they say the teaching of the Prophet, they include Qur'an as part of that teaching. And of course, they think he wrote the Qur'an anyway, right? So, so they put, they're putting together, I've said Sira and Hadith. Yes, but actually, Qur'an is in there too, just to make that clear, right? So when they say, sign Labor and sign Lira, or his life and his teachings, it's really Sira and then Qur'an and Hadith as the teachings. So this is how they covered it. So it's really, you'd write one book, which would be... Um, all of kind of your source material. They might have a different book about what Muslims do, or you know, you know, they might have something else uh, that reflected other aspects of tradition. But when it comes to this question of Quran and Hadith, which is what I want to talk about today, it would all be put together into one 
uh, subject. Right. And then um, uh, this is um, when we come on to um, uh, Noldika. I've got something there on the, on the Quran. Um, we can um, we can get, but you can we can do that uh, in a few hours' time or when we get the chance. So we'll come back to how Quranic study starts. But what happens is Noldika, Theodore Noldika, he branches out of this to just focus on Quranic studies, just on the Quran. So he is a development from this movement. Um, and then you have um, uh, Hadith, just to um, give you some brief uh, understanding of Hadith here as well. So what you will see in these early texts that I've just mentioned is Hadith is at first um, used, uh, it's, it's, well, at first they don't even know, know, the, know the Hadith, they just make the Hadith up. When they do discover and translate the Hadith, they take them pretty much at face value. So they're not very critical of Hadith because they want to use the Hadith to um, attack the Prophet as they see it, right, or attack Islam. So they'll come to the Hadith and they'll say, ah, look, here's a Hadith in which the Prophet did so and so, and, you know, and here's the criticism we can make of that. Um, uh, and, you know, I mentioned about how it's taught alongside Sira. Now, what we're gonna, who we're going to come on to next is um, Goldzia, and Ignaz Goldzia, uh, in a book called Mohammedanish Studien, which is 80, 1889 to 1890, right, he is the first person to really focus on hadith as a discipline, and he discusses the isnad. And um, he is the first person to actually have a critical approach to, it, to hadith and to isnads, really within the Western uh, scholarship. So it's taken from, and this is not to make a criticism or to be um, facetious, but it's taken uh, well over, uh, we could say, um, 1,200 years um, since is Islam, or maybe if we're going to say, well, Muslims took some time themselves to develop their hadith disciplines and develop Isnad scholarship and so on. It's taken a good thousand years for Western scholarship to actually say, let's have a look at the Isnad system, right? Just so you're aware. So it's taken a thousand years, and, 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 and Islam in the meanwhile has had its whole classical period, its uh, post-classical period, and it's been obviously colonised now, you know, and so we're into the kind of so-called um, uh, decline and, you know, l you know, reform period and so on, right? So we're in, we're in this very late, I mean, it depends how you judge it, but we're in a period where Islam has, you know, all the books are there, all the work's been done. Suyuti, uh, who stands at the end of the tradition, has been probably passed away for like 300 years or something, you know. Um, you know, you're really in this very, very late stage, right? You, you're getting like, you're just about to have Muhammad Abdul, you know, and now the Western scholars are um, uh, coming, to, uh, coming to look at um, Isnad systems, right? Um, so this is the context. But what's interesting is that, uh, and this is, you know, with the Western scholars scholarship, they started late, but when they start to get going, they start to go pretty quickly, right? And so the developments in that time till now, just over maybe 120 years, if you look at the developments, they're, you know, they have, done a lot of work um, uh, and tried to develop things quite significantly. And now, obviously, the picture has changed. When we talk into the uh, contemporary period, we're, not, we're no longer going to be able to make simple judgments of East and West. Right? Things become much more uh, uh, fluid in, in many ways. But we'll come on to that. Um, so he, um, what's interesting about Goldzia, um, I'll give you, uh, we'll kind of um, see, what, see what, how we're going for time as well. Uh, OK, yeah, so we need to be pretty quick. Um, so Goldzia. I'll talk about him um, before um, uh, 3 o'clock, inshallah, and um, try to get on to Shakt. Shakt can actually come into the second period, as long as I cover Goldzia, it doesn't matter. Um, so, Goldzia, um, he is a Hungarian, Jewish, and a scholar of um, Judaism, Semitic languages. And a lot of these scholars, they, would be mu they wouldn't just learn Arabic, or be an Arabic specialist, as you might get today sometimes. Um, you will get... Um, uh, specialists in, in the whole Semitic languages, so Hebrew, uh, uh, Arabic, they might know, you know, Assy Syriac, uh, you know, Syriac or Assyrian, ancient language, a ancient Semitic languages as well. And they would be studying broadly in these fields. Now, Goldzia was a masterful scholar. Um, really, they say, like, one of the best, best scholars of his era, of his, like, beyond even his generation, like, you know, of maybe of the century, right? Really amazing, the level of his scholarship. And the reason you can tell this is that he actually, he doesn't, we just, we, we might often sort of study him and say, oh, well, he was someone who criticized Hadith, right? But actually, um, he studied, he was the, one of the first people to write about 
the Zahiriya. He was one of the first people to write systematically about the Shia, right? He wrote about schools of Quranic uh, scholarship and tafsir. You know, so he, he pretty much, um, you could say, laid the kind of blueprint for 20th century Western scholarship on Islam. He pretty much said, these are the main areas of study. You can look at the Shia, you can look at Hadith, you can look at, in a way that, you know, you see the previous people had been just doing these polemical things about the Prophet's life and teachings. He went rigorously and said, no, the, there are ulum al-hadith, right? And uh, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, um, he, actually, he actually read the books in, you know, in manuscript, in Arabic. Um, he read books on ulum al-hadith to understand the, the discipline and then summarized it and wrote about it, right? So the, there's a step change with Goldzir from the scholarship and he really forces everyone to raise their game. He actually himself personally uh, uh, was actually quite sympathetic on a personal level to Islam and Muslims. He, he lived uh, in Cairo, he went to Cairo, um, studied there. Um, he, 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 was sort of, um, he actually studied with Muslim uh, scholars in Azhar. Um, he would be allowed into the libraries. Um, he would, um, uh, he would like, literally study the text and study. So, um, you know, he had a good personal relationship um, uh, and he found things in Islam which, which he felt, you know, uh, you know, as a religious Jew, he felt he could connect with those things. Uh, one time he, he um, disguised himself and went and att attended the Jummah prayers in, in Cairo and he prayed and he actually said later this was one of the most spiritual experiences of my life. So he had, he had like um, quite interesting take. Now that, that doesn't mean that he didn't come with, with a lot of criticism towards uh, uh, the Hadith um, uh, disciplines uh, and so you know that's something that um, uh, can be borne in mind as well. And his main idea um, is that when he looked at... Um, Early, um, uh, early scholarship on Hadith, when he looked at the early Hadith collections and looked at the context of the time, what he realized is, and this is very true, um, that there were many sectarian groups in early Islam. You know, you had, um, you had sort of uh, Shia developing, you had very, you know, the Mu'tazila or the early Qadriya, you had, um, you know, Qawarij, Ibadiya, all these different groups emerging, right? Traditionists, um, Murjia, and what he found is that if you, it, he doesn't just obviously focus just on one sectarian group. He would look at Shia Hadith, he would look at Sunni Hadith, he would look at Ibadi Hadith or Khawariji or Dahiri or whatever. He would look at all these different uh, um, types of um, texts. And he would say, well, look, each group has, have their own traditions. You know, some of, some of those traditions are saying that the other group, you know, is, is completely unacceptable, but these other people, they also have their traditions. So he, th from this, and it was on a, say on an anecdotal basis, so just on the basis of having seen this khilaf, this difference and these uh, fights in the early community, he, he assumed that, and he also got this from the tradition itself, that many people were fabricating hadith in the early period, which is agreed. I mean, Muslims agree this as well, right? That many hadith were fabricated. And he said, well, people would fabricate hadith to support their cause, which is very true. And so really... Um, he said, and because of this, um, we can't really rely on uh, the Hadith corpus. There was fabrication, people provided an isnad, um, and really what you're seeing, when you have a, a, a text and an isnad, what you're really seeing, he thinks, is you're seeing whatever the person at the start of the isnad, um, want, you know, or in a prominent position in the isnad, um, wants to say about the early period. So, so say you have a, a hadith in the collection, uh, collection of, of Bukhari or someone. You say, this was just telling us what Bukhari wants to support from early times, right? Um, he says it could be that some of this material is genuine, but we have no strong way of knowing, right? How, um, um, how to know, how to distinguish between what's genuine and what's uh, falsified within the hadith. Um, likewise, he, um, so and he would say the same thing for like the Shia or any other group. They would just have their own hadith that reflects what they want to believe about the early period. Um, the, and so he invents um, this concept which is taken on by uh, Schacht, um, which, is, which is like uh, the, called the, maybe that's not, maybe I use a strong pen. Uh, this idea of the um, uh, back projection of Isnads. Right. Right. Back projection of Isnad. So what this means is 
that this is really important when we can do some more technical stuff after the break, um, is say you have um, your collector here, right? Uh, and so you have a, a matan of the, of, the, of the hadith, right? Matan, the text of the hadith, right? Then what you're going to see, what he thinks is that the isnad, you know, the scholars will just give an isnad, um, but the isnad will only originate at wherever this person lived. So maybe second century or third century. And this whole isnad here, this is just, as it were, being developed, being, being added on, being, being given, uh, being uh, attached, right? So he doesn't see any value in the isnads themselves. Um, uh, although, he, if you read his, his writing, he seems at times to respect the scholarship um, of the Muslim scholars who dealt with isnads. So it seems there's a bit of a contradiction. So I think really what he, the difference, if you want to put it in a nutshell, between someone like Goldzia and the more traditional viewpoint of Ahl Hadith is that both, both camps say in the, you know, the Hadith were fabricated. And there are some true Hadith, true reports from the early period that were passed on as well. The difference is the Muslim scholars say the Muhaddithin were able to filter out what was weak and what was what was authentic and what was not authentic. The Muhaddithin were able to filter the fabrication to say that there's this much, uh, there's this m many hadith, right, of all types. And only, only this, this much is genuine. What Muslim scholars say is that the Muhaddithin were able to isolate this from this. What Goldzia says is, no, they were not able to. So you're just left with this unknowable, what is true, what, what is core within the Hadith, you're not able to determine. That's what Goldzia thinks, right? So, um, so, he, so he has some sympathy for the scholars. And maybe he thinks in some cases they were able to determine it. But taken to the point of like the whole of Bukhari, does he think... Um, and so he thinks because the Isnad system isn't able to determine this accurately, the only way you really can tell is you just look at the matan. So you look at the matan and you find out, okay, is it giving something that would obviously be of the benefit to a particular group in early Islam? Right, so if there's a hadith like um, the, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the, the Qadariya are the majus of this ummah or something, right? The, 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 pe the, pe the Qadariya, you know, the, mod like the people who b didn't believe in fate in Qadr, right? Or something like this, or there's the Zindi, the Zanadika or something. Then he would say, well, this is obviously a polemical attack against the Qadariya. It can't be uh, 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 from the Prophet. So likewise, anything with a prophecy that later becomes fulfilled, right? So anything in the Hadith that seems to talk about the early centuries and the different civil wars of the companions, anything like that, they would say, well, this, this can't be, this is just after the fact they've invented this. Uh, likewise, anything... Um, talking about the issues between uh, Ali and Muawiyah and Sifin and anything like that, right? So really, um, what he might accept is some of the kind of basic core principles and teachings that just, he thinks, well, this is logically, it was always there. But anything with any sort of political uh, aspect, he would be very suspicious of that, right? So uh, this is um, what, what, Schacht, uh, what Goldsier does. Now, Schacht, um, so we'll talk about Schacht and we'll probably um, take a break um, uh, maybe midway through. So, so Joseph Schacht, um, so also I'll tell you Goldzier's, um, Goldzier died in um, 1921. So it's good, I'm going to give you every major person I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a death date, just, so, just like we do in the uh, uh, study of Hadith, just so we, we know when these people were active and when they influence would have stopped. Yeah, and, and, and please do ask questions, but you have to take the mic. Yeah. Can you repeat the date? 1921. Yeah, so do ask questions. I mean, uh, um, if you, something comes to your mind, you want a cl clarification on it, it will make it more interactive for me. I mean, I can just go on and on, but um, maybe that's not the best thing. But maybe, hopefully, they'll start to emerge over time as you uh, uh, process. Uh, I know it's a bit much, especially if you haven't done much on this before. So Joseph Schacht was a German scholar, and he... Um, 
I've got some, actually some information about him which I might refer to. Um, so, Schacht um, was um, born about the turn of the century in Poland, actually. But uh, he um, grew up in Germany, educated there. Um, and he studied with someone called uh, Bergstrasse, and uh, Otto, I think Otto, uh, no, uh, no, not Otto Bergstrasse, Otto Pretzel, but Bergstrasse. Now, Bergstrasse, we'll come on to him when we do um, Quran. So he's just a, a Semitic language scholar who we're going to come to. So that was his uh, uh, Ustad. And then um, in 1927, when he was only 25 years old, Schacht became the youngest professor in the whole of Germany. So this is pre-war, well, interwar, right? After the First World War, um, so the sort of Weimar Republic, right? And he left voluntarily because of Na the Nazis in 1934. So interestingly, again, just to sort of, I like to sort of um, pop some of our bubbles about these Orientalists. Um, so we think of Schacht, if you've heard of him, oh, he's the guy who hates... He's against Hadith, and he's, you know, he's really strict. But actually, he was, seems, on a, on again, on a personal level, he was, he was, eth he was ethical. You know, he, 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 have, he had no time for the Nazis. He left Germany when they started to come into power pretty early on, 1934. Many people stayed and kind of went along with it, the Nazism. And he taught in Cairo for five years, right? So he went out to Cairo. He taught for five years. He was going through a lot of manuscripts in that time. Uh, he was one of the first people who identified the Kitab al-Tawheed of uh, Imam al he actually identified this is an important manuscript. Um, uh, so, you know, he was just majorly involved, just generally in Islamic studies. Involved in the Encyclopedia of Islam, if you've uh, heard of this publication, which is now in its third, into its third edition, or uh, they're developing the third edition. It's like a huge encyclopedia about Islam from the Western uh, Orientalist kind of perspective. Um, he worked for the BBC uh, in, the U uh, in the UK in 1939. So basically, when war kicked off, well, World War II kicked off, he actually was in the UK and he um, helped, you know, because obviously he, as, a, as a German, he was able to be useful for sort of uh, anti-propaganda, BBC communications and general uh, effort against Nazis. Um, and so um, uh, later he became a British citizen after, you know, helping in the war. Um, and he was uh, at Oxford in 1946. Um, so after the war finished, he went to Oxford and was a professor there. Leiden, another major center in, in, you know, in Holland, where they, you, know, you have Brill publications from there, in 1954, and then Columbia in New York, in America, in 1957. Uh, and he died in, I think, 1969. Uh, yeah, he died in 1969. So this is Joseph Schacht. Now, his major work is... Um, so, that, so now we've like made, made ourselves really sympathetic towards, towards him. Now we can... Uh, uh, critique him and uh, criticize his views, right? Because I think um, when you read his work, there's this kind of arrogance there as well. So I think on one hand, um, you know, I think on a personal level, you know, as an intellectual, and he, you know, he seems to have been um, kind of uh, against the excesses of Nazis, and we wanted an open culture and so on. At the same time, he, um, in the views he took within Islamic studies, there was a degree of dogmatism to his opinions and his theories. Uh, and this kind of classic kind of, you know, oriental, orientalist kind of arrogance, you can kind of detect that in, in the way he writes a little bit, that he just thinks certain things are obvious and that Muslims just did, you know, did this and did that. We'll go on to that now. So his main work, you need to be aware of, is the um, 1950 Origins of Mohammedan Jur Jurisprudence, right? So this is um, uh, the Origins of Mohammedan Jurisprudence, right? Very important book. This, this really sets the agenda for... Hadith studies in the Western, in, in the West, until not quite till today, but I would say until um, the 90s, right? It's, it's setting the agenda more or less until the night, until for the next 40 years. So, second half of the 20th century is it's under the the kind of complete sway of sort of sh so-called Shaktian thinking, right? So he deserves um, uh, uh, some discussion of, of what he actually uh, thought about um, and. Um, um, what he, um, and then just another thing, so he also had an introduction to Islamic law in 1964. He did things on, like, he, he did some things on contemporary Muslim law as well. Uh, numerous articles in Encyclopedia of Islam, one and, edition one and two. Um, but his major ideas um, is basically 
he, his major idea in his, in his work was, um, first of all, he completely assumes Goldsey's idea about the back projection of Hadith, right? Um, so he completely assumes that Goldsey has got this idea right, that the Hadith, the Isnads of Hadith grow backwards. And he wants to now push that further to get results in Islamic stu in, in, in basically in Hadith studies. But he's as much interested in, uh, in Hadith studies as in what we could call sort of the history of Islamic law, right? The early development of fiqh is also his field, because he's kind of inter interested in Islamic law as well. So he, has, he comes up in the origins of, his, of Muhammadan jurisprudence. Um, uh, yeah, um, for, for, for the origin of Muhammadan jurisprudence, he um, deals with um, this question of not only how did hadith develop, but how did, how did fiqh develop, how did law develop, and how does authority in law develop. So we're going to stop uh, for the first break. When we come back in the second session, we're going to look at uh, Shaq's theory, how that's developed by uh, Junbal, and then uh, the response in, in more recent times of, of Motsky. But um, right now, um, I've got a question uh, online, um, uh, and it's asking about uh, the main points in uh, Mustafa al-Azami's critique of Shaq, in on Shaq's origins of Muhammad jurisprudence, and how, and the question stops there. Um, um, so. Uh, the, um, what I will do is when I discuss Shaq's, Shaq, Shaq, I haven't really outlined his theory yet, I've just kind of introduced you to him. Inshallah, uh, after the break, I'll uh, outline Shaq's theory and I will then say to what extent does uh, uh, Azami respond to that and what's the, what, put Azami's book in context and give you my opinion on that book as well uh, and so on. So I'll, I'll cover that, uh, one, but there's no point talking about the critique until I've actually said the theory properly, and I haven't, I've just sort of said this rough idea. So any other questions before we have a break? Um, okay, so we'll take a break, um, inshallah, just to, you know, just to freshen everyone's minds again, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back for round two of Hadith, inshallah. Okay,